Oh, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate uh, being able to come out and talk to you about how the state's demographics are, are changing and what we can expect moving into the future. Um, if you can't hear me, if I'm sometimes the mic kind of does that and I fade out, so if that happens, just remind me that I'm talking to people and not to myself. Um, and if we would also like to take um, bets on how long it takes me to trip over one of these chairs, um, I think that the betting is open on that. Uh, it's not going to be long. I tend to walk around while I'm talking, so watch for that. That's going to be fun. Okay. So there's some topics that we're going to talk about today. I want to talk about the um, 2020 census results because that's going to be the sort of the base for um, all of our measurement of population moving forward throughout the decade. Um, how populations change, what we can expect, and why the, some of the issues we are seeing now in the labor force um, have been expected for a while because those um, difficulties are baked into our population structure. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. <laughs> Diversity is a long-term trend. Uh, Minnesota is becoming more diverse, but it is not something that happened overnight. It is something that has been happening for quite a while, and we'll uh, delve into that a little bit more as well. And then that's going to lead us into the general uh, talk about the labor force pressures, what we're experiencing, and wrapping up why we're experiencing them. <clears throat> Just as a spoiler alert, um, when we're talking about the difficulties um, in uh, growing Minnesota's population, what we are going to be talking about, the major themes, are um, a long-term trend in declining fertility rates am among most of the population of the state um, and a need for um, strong international migration to keep the population growth strong. Um, so that's going to be, in a nutshell, the, uh, the takeaways from the presentation. <laughs> okay, so I gave you, gave you that up front, but let's, let's see why. So when we take a look at the 2020 census, um, there are a number of good things to, to, to recognize. First, that Minnesota's population um, topped out at over 5.7 million persons. Um, Minnesota grew by 346,000 people, um, or 6.5%, and that puts us at 15 and 19 uh, uh, place, respectively, for population change and percent change. This is all not, um, it, it's not all as boring as this, I promise. I do have pictures and, and graphics to make it a little more exciting. But um, just to get through the numbers first, um, Texas led for numeric change. Utah was uh, highest for uh, percent change. And Illinois um, was the, the top uh, state that lost population over the, uh, between the period 2010 and 2020. So when we look at Minnesota's population over time, it has been increasing and we expect it to continue increasing. The difference is where we're going to see those increases moving forward. We're expecting much more increases in the population that's over 18 years of age and much less increase in the population under 18 years of age, which is reinforcing that structural issue in our, in our population. Um, you know, long and the short of it is, um, like everything else, if these, if these millennials would just get off their uh, butts and, you know, realize their potential fertility, we would be doing a lot better. But <laughs> they're not. I'm just, just joking, of course. Um, the long-term drops in fertility are a, um, a trend that we've been seeing since at least the 1970s um, when fertility rates topped out and have been coming down. When we look at these 2020 census results, uh, we can see that almost every group in the state has uh, increased in size. There's one exception to that. Um, if we were in a classroom or a smaller setting, I'd, I'd quiz you and try to see if you could pick out which group didn't increase, but it's... it's um, pretty evident. The only group that didn't increase were the individuals under 18 years of age who identify as white. It's not necessarily that they moved out or they're gone or, or, or something like that. It's so we're talking about aging over an artificial um, threshold, 18 years, and with declining fertility rates, we have fewer people coming up behind to replace them in that group. Okay. All the other groups, however, um, have increased in size, and that's through a combination of um, migration and, and uh, stronger fertility as well. So if we compare the two just visually over time, we can see um, <clears throat> specifically in the under 18-year-old uh, population how much more diverse that is becoming and how much more, um, um, more, much more diverse it's becoming. Uh, we can see that the two groups that are uh, sort of leading uh, in, in increasing that diversity are the um, young Hispanic persons and young persons identify as African-American. Um, and, you know, a lot of folks think that 
those increases, those changes in population composition and structure are, are happening um, just in the, the metro area or, or something like that, and it's really not. I have some distribution maps that are, I find um, pretty interesting that are going to kind of show how these population changes are really happening across the state, um, not just in one area, though um, for certain groups a lot of the population change or population concentrations are still around um, some of our smaller urban areas, and we'll, we'll take a look at that in a moment as well. When we look at the change over time, um, in the, over the past two decades, we can see that the populations, um, the non-white populations have more than doubled over that period, while the, the uh, population identifies as white increased by about 3%. Right? So when we think about our growth, our growth is really in um, those, those non-white categories and um, in our uh, migratory categories, people that have moved into the state, um, especially uh, strong is the um, presence of our foreign-born migrants that are uh, really serving to keep our population um, growing. Um, without our international migration, Minnesota population would begin to shrink um, because we do see more out-migration to other states than we see in-migration from other states. <clears throat> okay, so where is the population growing and shrinking? The strongest population growth has been in the metropolitan area, but we can see that the population growth has been all over the state, um, primarily in the center and north part of the state, but also down to the um, um, southeastern corner as well. When we look at um, the proportion of growth, most of it has occurred um, within the um, 20 cities metro in terms of just the um, number of people coming in. Right, so it, you know, the number of people coming in is highest in the metro area because that's the area of the state that we have the highest population already, so that's a draw for those persons. However, um, <clears throat> there are also outstate uh, places that have seen significant growth. Between Hennepin, Ramsey, and was it Dakota counties, we saw an uh, increase of over 185,000. Uh, and then Wright, Olmsted, and Stearns counties round out the, the top 10 for, for increases. When we look at population declines, it's Basically, everything, everybody else, all the other counties have seen um, population declines. Um, <clears throat> Kuching, Renvo, and Martin counties and St. Louis counties um, saw significant declines, uh, each lost in excess of 1,200 people. Um, the average was 543 persons, and when we look at the average percent loss over the <clears throat> decade, it's just over 4%. Excuse me, I'm getting a little bit of a tickle in my throat. <clears throat> <clears throat> Pardon me. Okay. So I've rattled on about the 2020 census for a while, and, I, and I've given you kind of a heads up that, you know, we are going to be looking at some very specific um, issues moving forward because of our structural change in the population. To understand that fully, we have to understand how populations change, right? And this isn't going to be a surprise to anybody. There are only three things that can change a population over time. Uh, and I got to tell you, when I was in um, grad school and my advisor told me you're only going to be studying three things, I thought, hot damn, I can do this. Um, I picked the right major. Um, but, um, you know, anybody that, that works with people or animals, you know, you understand how populations change. And there are only three things that can do it. We're talking about births, deaths, and migration, right? You, have, you either move in, you're born into a population, or you die out and leave a population. That's the only things that can change it. Oh, migration. There we go. Um, when we think about those three things, though, and how complex they are in terms of understanding the dynamics and how they affect the population, there is a, a lot to study and a lot to understand. When we think about birth, we're talking about different cultural reasons for um, different levels of fertility, different incentives, um, different understandings of the value of children, right, which affects those fertility rates, which are all culturally dependent. Um, deaths has a lot to do with socioeconomic status, we're talking about access to health care, um, and, and the varying ways that those are available, not only in this country, but across the, across the planet. And of course, there are myriad reasons for, for migration, um, both individually and in the aggregate. When we think about how these items fit together, um, this is the only formula I'm going to give you, but it's a pretty easy one, but it helps conceptually understand the way that populations change. When we think about a population at time two, so some point in the future, that's always going to be equal to the population at time one, say now, plus births minus deaths 
plus the interaction of in and out migration. When we think of the interaction of births and deaths, we're talking about natural change. Um, that can be positive, natural growth, negative, natural decline, or just in general natural change. When we think about the confluence of um, migration, what we're talking about is um, net migration. The net figure, um, total ins minus total outs, will give us how much the population has changed. If we have any two of those um, num numbers, so births, deaths, or migration, we can figure out the third with some, some simple, simple algebra, which is really useful because we don't get good migration statistics. We have to usually derive them because we do have very good population numbers and we usually have very good births and deaths numbers. So the, de the deriving of the migration numbers also comes, to, uh, comes out fairly accurate. The problem comes in, in in trying to tease out the components of that. So what portion of that is international migration? What portion of that is domestic migration? Because we don't keep as good a records or, or registries like we do for, for births and deaths. Right? So uh, understanding how those components play out is something that we usually rely on the Census Bureau um, to help us tease out um, if we need to look at those components. But if we're just looking at things like um, births, deaths, and migration, we can figure them out um, in the aggregate for the state or, or for an area if we have the, the data for it. When we look at this data, these are for the state, um, and they go back to, to 1990 <clears throat> through 2020. Not sure why I'm <clears throat> keep getting a uh, frog in my throat. I'm I'm not sick. I, <laughs> I should have done my vocal exercises this morning, I guess. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, the green and the blue line are the births and deaths line. So that's the number that we have really good numbers, really good statistics for, and really good tracking of. And you can see in the recent time they've been converging. Right, the lines are coming together. So that means births are coming down, and deaths are going up. We should expect that to some degree with declining fertility rates and a population that is aging, right? We, we have our um, baby boom generation that is, is getting older and it's going to, as we move into the future, begin to feel the effects of mortality, um, which is a euphemism that I like to use in, in groups that, that contain mixed populations because it's difficult to talk about people dying, especially when they're sitting in front of you. Um, but the, the the baby boom generation will eventually begin to leave the population, which is another nice way to say um, die off. Um, but the dotted red line is the, uh, is the confluence of, of births and deaths. So we're talking about bringing those together um, and seeing how that is affecting the population. We can see that the general trend on that dotted line is down, meaning the as we move into the future, that line is going to eventually cross zero, and there will probably be a time um, in Minnesota's uh, future that is well, we will be in a period of natural decline, meaning we're going to have more births than we had deaths. So in the absence of migration, our population would naturally go down because we have more people dying out than we have being put into the population. The good thing is that Minnesota does have strong migration, and that migration is um, healthy partially because of our strong international migration. That, that helps quite a bit. And as I mentioned earlier, we do tend to lose more people to other states than we gain, but we make up for that in the, in the international migration. So we can see that migration has come down considerably over the last decade than it was in the previous decade. And especially since about 2016 or 2017, we've seen a sharp um, dip in that migration statistic. Um, this is gonna become important when we're talking about job openings because the decline in migrants that we've seen over that period from about 2016 to, to, to about 2020, 2021, is about um, a little over 100,000 people if we choose the 2016 levels as um, an average. So if we think that that should have been moving forward, then we are short about 100,000 people, which is not insignificant when we think about um, the labor shortages that we're seeing in the state. Um, so we're, we're down about 100,000 people just from migration. As I mentioned, the population moving forward is expected to increase over time, but that increase is going to be in the 18 and over population. We expect the 17 and under population to be relatively flat. Um, that can change. Um, and a lot of people like to talk about um, demography and um, demographic science as um, destiny. 
meaning you know, you're not going to be able to change your demographic destiny, but I, I don't believe that, and that's never really been the case. The reason that I do what I do um, is to come out and talk to folks so that they understand what we see coming into the future and they can make whatever changes or adjustments necessary to accommodate that future or to change it in a way that um, more comports to what, what they would like to see moving forward. Right? So when I show you that the 17 and under population is going to remain relatively flat, you know, that is dependent on several assumptions. The assumptions are that the fertility rates remain constant, that um, the relative level of migration remains constant, but there are some things that we know, right? So if we are dependent upon international migrants, typically the migrants that we've been receiving have higher fertility rates than um, the overall population uh, for the state. So as we bring in more international migrants, they are typically coming in uh, in the appropriate ages for uh, family formation, um, and they're coming in uh, in their prime workforce years as well. So we have a double aid right there. We have um, them coming here and likely starting families, which will contribute to the younger generation, and they're coming here typically ready to engage in, in some sort of gainful employment. Um, so helping in, 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 both, in both ways. We, we get more people and we are setting up the future for, for getting more people as well. Those higher fertility rates usually bleed into the second generation and then by the third generation international migrants, their children, tip, their grandchildren actually, typically um, have adopted the fertility patterns of the place at which they, they currently live. So um, we have about two generations of increased fertility that we expect to see um, from, from our international migrants which will help perhaps bring up that, um, that bottom line, the 17 and under, which is going to be really valuable for things like maintaining school enrollment. Um, I'm a, a, a rural sociologist by training, and you know when we think about the um, impacts on local communities that occur when schools close or consolidate, those, those sorts of, of changes, the idea that we're going to be bringing in folks that have higher fertility and will help those schools um, continue to have, have uh, enough persons to remain open it, it is a good thing. Um, we haven't seen those increases as yet. They have been remaining relatively flat, but um, as we, our population gets older and more jobs open up, um, what we expect to see are, are, are pull factors that will increase um, that migration and hopefully bring in more people to fill out the bottom uh, are, are the lower um, age groups in our population structure to help the population continue to grow. Okay, this diagram is a population pyramid. It's one of my favorite kinds of, of, of um, graphics. It's one of the things that the demographers use quite a bit. There are 86 uh, bars on each side, right? So 172 bars total. The, the level of each individual bar is not necessarily what we're trying to, to look at because it's very difficult to get many meaning from all of those individual bars. What we're looking at here is the total structure, what the population looks like, uh, where the bulges are, and uh, you know, how can we use that to, to look into the future. This is from 1990, and we can see the big bulge there from like um, 25 to 45, um, it's the baby boom generation. As we set the graphic in motion, there we go, um, we can see that population moving up, right? And right about 2010 or so, we'll start to see the baby boom generation crossing the 65 year mark, which is that gray line, that gray box. Now, we are working on making sure that, or a lot of people are working on making sure that folks are staying in the labor force longer and are, are continuing to contribute their expertise for you know, as long as they can. But 65 is, is the year, the, the age that we traditionally think of people retiring at. So um, that's what we use when we're trying to understand the, the impacts on the labor force. At about 2010 or so was when um, we had been, in the demographic community, had been talking about for, for a while that there are going to be labor shortages as the baby boom generation begins to leave the labor force, right? Because the... Um, you can see behind it, the, the, as it curves in, that's uh, Generation X, which is a smaller generation uh, behind the baby boom generation. And then we can see the millennial generation coming after um, Generation X, and they have kind of shrunk in a little bit. They're not as wide of a generation as they had started out. 
Um, so we have, um, we've lost some to migration, but we've also gained other age groups that have um, made them a less of a total in the a total proportion of the, of the state's population. Translate that. Some other places have gotten more millennials than we've gotten. We still have quite a few, a few and their generational size is still going to be a little bit larger um, than the baby boom population. So realization of their potential fertility could still happen and we could see stabilization of our fertility rates. But when we think about their population overall, they are getting past um, the points of that we usually see for uh, onset of first child and first marriage. I should just say marriage because we, we don't want to assume it's going to be a first. But um, 27 and 28 are the respective ages for those, those two events usually on average. Um, <clears throat> so what we're seeing is delayed fertility in the millennial generation. When we talk about delayed fertility, in aggregate, that's always going to be reduced fertility. So we're expecting to, those fertility declines to continue. And you can see that the bottom of the pyramid is kind of, uh, in the first five or so years, is starting to um, cut in again, which is indicative of, of lower fertility rates. So that's, you know, when we talk about the population structure and structural challenges for the population growth, that's what we're really talking about. We're talking about part of the population moving out of the labor force as they cross the 65-year mark, and there being fewer people coming up behind them. And if we think about our economic system, it is really based on continual growth. So in order to continually grow your economic system, you also have to have workers behind them to make sure that those that, that system can be staffed. Right? Um, there are some... Um, ways that the individual organizations can become more efficient and perhaps need fewer staff. Um, but right now, those sort of changes are more on the margin and continual population growth is still necessary to, to maintain um, the economy. Okay. This graphic, I think, illustrates um, what I was saying pretty clearly as well. This is the annual change in persons 65 years or older. Uh, we can see that every year since about 2010, we've, ha we've seen significantly more people turning 65, which, of course, we saw in the previous graphic at, that that's the baby boom generation aging past that artificial um, year boundary. This, again, um, is, I think, very interesting because what we're seeing here is that we already have more people in the population that are over 65 years of age than are under 65 years of age. <clears throat> when we think about how this is distributed across the state, we tend to see higher median ages in our, our small, smaller and more um, uh, sparsely populated areas. So, you know, whereas in a, in a more urban area, the median age might be 37, something like that, in some of our um, more rural areas, the median age may be 47 or, or over 50 in some areas. Right, so when we're talking about half the population being close to or over 50, um, that is um, going to create an issue for uh, the continued fertility because you know half the population is already past their uh, primary productive years. So I don't know if I mentioned this, but demographers are terrible people. Um, we we tend to talk about things fairly frankly. I mean, just the notion of of talking about. One of the most joyous events in somebody's life, having a child, is the onset of first children. You know, it makes it sound like a disease. Um, demographers are terrible people. Um, so, so if I say something that's, that sounds a little off to you, um, it's because I'm terrible. Um, but, but that's about it. No, seriously, it's just that we have to be relatively frank about what we're seeing in the data so that we can understand what we need to do to move forward. Um, and one of the things that we need to do to move forward is understand how our populations are changing because that is going to affect um, how we are able to allocate our resources um, to accommodate that change in population, okay? So when we think about the impacts of an aging population, um, there's going to be decreased revenue from some um, from income tax and some very specific um, taxes, um, shifts in spending priorities. I already talked about you know the importance of education, especially in, in smaller communities. But how is that going to be balanced with the need for increased levels of elder care? Um, and how do we make sure that there are resources for those that want to stay in their home for as long as possible? 
So you know, them being able to age in place. And you know, those labor force pressures you know, that we, we've kind of been alluding to um, the whole presentation. Oh, why did that? I think I hit the wrong button. I'm much better with technology than I than I appear to be. Um, okay, uh, labor force pressures. Correct button this time. Okay, this topic diversity is a long term trend. I, I find to be particularly fascinating, and, and it runs counterintuitive to what some folks think um, about the population. Although when I have given this talk or, or shown some of these slides in other venues. Um, the results have been basically like, yeah, yeah, we, we see that in our local communities, and, and, and we have, um, uh, and our communities have been made stronger for it. So let's, let's get into the data a little bit. When we think about each individual group as a proportion of the total population, um, we can see the, the only group that is not represented on this graph are the uh, persons who identify as white because they do constitute the majority of the population, and were they to be included on this graph, the lines would all be flat because of the scale problem, right? I'm gonna show you what, what the white population looks like in a second, but as we can see here, we've had increases in our um, African American, our Hispanic, and our um, Asian American groups um, that have been very, very significant. We, we've seen increases um, over the period. Um, some of these groups have doubled. If we look at the dotted lines, those are the persons under 18 years of age. We can also see that those populations are growing Right? They have increased as a total proportion of the population. So that stands in contrast to what we saw in some of the previous graphs where we saw the 17 and under population uh, remaining relatively stagnant. Right? So if we think about the arithmetic, back to that formula, how that would work, um, we, our, our groups, our minority groups, excuse me, our communities of color, um, have to have higher fertility rates than the, the white population in order to make those lines um, increase, be, have a positive slope, okay? Um, that's just, a lot of this stuff is, is very um, basic arithmetic, but I think seeing it in, in, in graphic form really helps the, the relationships uh, pop. Okay, the only group here that ha does not have significant increases um, are the um, Native American group. Uh, they, their lines are relatively flat. But if we think about, again, how the, the dynamics of population change work, in order to remain flat in a period of increasing population, their raw populations have increased. It's just that they've remained relatively steady as a proportion of the total population. Okay. As I mentioned, this is the um, white population. A person who identifies as white, obviously, if every other group in the state has been increasing, then as a proportion of the total state population, the white population has been decreasing since 1990. In 1990, the uh, population uh, that identified as white was over 90% of the population. Now it's closer to 80% of the population. So even though we had a lot of stories coming out of the 2020 census about the remarkable growth in diversity, that is very true. But it is not something that has isolated the period of 2010 to 2020. It is something that we've been seeing in the state for at least um, the last 30 years or so, for at least the last three decades. And we, are, we expect to continue to see that moving forward. We expect our state to continue to grow in this manner because of those, um, you know, the interaction of those um, dynamics. We see declining fertility rates in the, in, the, in the white population. We're going to begin to see increasing mortality rates as they begin to leave the population. And that is going to leave us with a a much more um, diverse population in the state and across the entire state, really. Again, a population pyramid. Um, the difference on this one, this one's in 1990, and the yellow and the orange bars show the proportion of the population that belonged to communities of color in 1990. If we pop that forward to 2020, we can see that they are much more significant proportion of the total population, which, again, reinforces the, the graphics that we saw previously. Okay, I took all that time to build up to the only topic people are really interested in talking about, the labor force dynamics, right? The reason I spent all that time leading up to this is because understanding how the population has changed allows us to understand the current situation that we're in and the current place we're in relative to uh, available workers for available jobs. Okay, 
I've already mentioned how important the foreign-born population is um, to continued population growth. We can see a number of, of counties in the state have relatively significant proportions of persons who were born outside the United States. Obviously, the, the counties in the core metro area have the highest um, um, number of, of foreign-born residents, but they do exist um, throughout, this, throughout the state. Nobles County actually has the highest proportion of persons who were born um, outside the U.S. In, in the entire state, even more than any of the uh, metro counties. And that's, you know, has to do with uh, international migrants coming in specifically for certain types of jobs that are available locally. Right? When we think about the um, top um, places that we have international migrants uh, coming from, we have um, Mexico is the first one, then, then Somalia, um, and then, you know, from there we, we break down into um, India, Thailand um, are also significant places that we receive international or have received international migrants from. The value of being an open and welcoming state for our prosperity moving forward cannot be overstated. These people that are, are coming in, we need in order to make sure that our state is able to continue to function. Um, the, the, and as this map shows, the foreign-born population is a higher presence in, in southern Minnesota than, than in far north Minnesota. There's a bunch of Canadians up there at the top. Um, <clears throat> can't keep them out, I guess. All right. Um, this is, a, this is an interesting graphic. This is the, um, this graphic is from DEED, the Department of um, uh, Employment and Economic Development in the state, and this is their most recent job vacancy survey data. And at that time, there were 200,000 open positions or eight open positions for every 100 jobs. If we'll think back to um, what I mentioned earlier, the aggregate number of international migrants that we have been missing um, since about 2016 or so is about 100,000 migrants. So we, we understand that not every person that would come in would necessarily have taken one of those jobs, but that number would likely be significantly smaller had those migrants been able to, to come in. And there are a variety of reasons why migration has fallen off. I can't get into all of them, but obviously the, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant effect on our, on our ability to receive international migrants and our ability to um, grow the population through, through migration. Um, when we look at the unemployment rates, um, we can see that uh, relative to the U.S., Minnesota has a, a very low unemployment rate, and it's considerably lower than the U.S. In fact, I was looking at, a, uh, I think it was sometime last fall, Minnesota had the lowest unemployment rate that had ever been recorded for any state in the, in the nation since it had been being recorded. So um, we were lowest that month for the nation, and we were lowest that month for all time. And we are, still have a very, very low um, unemployment rate. <clears throat> when we look at um, labor force participation, uh, of course there was a bit of a jag there for the COVID-19 pandemic, but we also have much higher labor force participation rates um, than the U.S. overall. Um, one thing to, to keep in mind is when we think of our international migrants, most of them, um, you know, they come in, uh, and most of them are, are, are ready to work right away, and they're also among the most entrepreneurial um, proportions of our population. A lot of uh, folks that come in tend to start businesses um, and uh, tend to have much higher levels of labor force participation um, than other groups in the state. Now, when we think about the distribution populations across the state. These are the maps that I was talking about. These are, I love these maps, but um, that's because I'm a nerd. Um, and so it's, it's to be expected. This is the general distribution of the population of the state. We can kind of see the concentration in the Twin Cities area, and that follows, the, the concentration follows um, you know, 94, that, that corridor, and it follows down into the southeast as well. Uh, we can see that the far northeast is, is um, very sparsely populated, which makes sense, right? Great North Woods and all. Um, the um, southwest corner is also more sparsely populated. You know, um, a lot of farmland down there. You know, um, the density is just going to be lower, right? 
Um, so this is the total population, and I, the maps I'm going to show you are the distributions for the various racial groups. I didn't make one for the white non-Hispanic group because, were I to, it would look almost exactly like this map because, as we saw, the white non-Hispanic group makes up about 80% of the population, 79-ish percent of the population, so the distribution would look almost identical to this total population map. But if we move on and look at um, some of our other communities of color, we can see that the African-American populations tend to um, be concentrated in the um, Twin Cities metro area. However, that is not solely the case. There are um, per persons who identify as African-American across the entire state. Um, some of the dots are very, very small, so um, some of our folks in the, in the more rural outlying areas are not really visible, but we can see a lot of our urban areas um, popping up on this map. You know, we can plainly see Mankato, Rochester, St. Cloud, um, that's Wilmer, um, Moorhead, obviously Duluth. We can, we can see the areas in which we have higher concentrations uh, of persons identify as African American. We move to our Native American population. Um, also more, more dispersed, um, significant concentrations in the, in the Twin Cities area, but also uh, in the reservation areas um, up in the northwestern part of the state, uh, and also some significant concentrations in the southern part of the state as well. Uh, our Asian American population is heavily concentrated in our urban areas as well. Um, like all populations in the state, they are also mixed throughout the state and, and, and dispersed. However, the highest concentrations are going to be in our urban areas, um, and especially the, the metro region. When we look at our population that have identified themselves as belonging to more than one racial category, we can see that those persons are distributed more widely across the state than any of the, the groups that we saw previously. Um, they are not just concentrated in our more urban areas. They are more um, spread out and more diffuse uh, across the state. This graphic is going to look very similar to the next one when we look at the distribution of our uh, Hispanic population. Part of the reason of that is many persons who identify as more than one race are also identifying as Hispanic in the data. Um, the Census Bureau is working on redesigning um, the question because there has been significant issues with certain groups, the Hispanic group, the people identify as Middle Eastern North African, not being able to really find themselves in the current format of the questions. And so for that reason, those persons are often put into either a some other race category or a multiracial, multiracial, multiple racial category. I can't talk this morning. Um, so that's part of the reason these two maps look, look very similar. Um, one thing to notice about the his, um, uh, map for Hispanic uh, Americans is that it's very um, diffuse across the state. We see lots of persons um, in our more sparsely populated areas. We also see uh, concentrations in southern Minnesota, uh, more and along all of the little small towns that we see along the highways and, and rivers um, across the state. So much more generally dispersed across the state than we have um, for our other categories. So when we think about um, you know, kind of the takeaways uh, from this, you know, in, in, declining, um, in an era of declining fertility, um, how is Minnesota going to be able to maintain population growth? Well, um, I, haven't, I didn't show you the graphics of, of the fertility trends over time other than the one for, for Minnesota, but if we think about the, the um, fertility trends, we are um, basically at one of the lowest total fertility rates that we've ever seen. When I was, when I was growing up, <clears throat> the, 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 the saying was, you know, the average family is going to have 2.3 kids, right? Um, that always sounded kind of ridiculous. Um, how do you have a, a third of a kid? You don't. Um, what that is really saying is that the average family is going to have less than three, less than three children, but there are going to be quite a few that have more than two, right? So that's just kind of the way we conceptualize that. Our current fertility rate uh, in the nation and the state is around 1.6, 1.7. So the average family or the average woman in her prime reproductive years currently is going to have fewer than two children. Many will have more than one, but most will have uh, fewer than two. All right, so that is a significant decrease in family size over time. And that is 
Um, part of the reason that as we continue to move forward, we are going to have to make sure that we are laser focused on making our communities and our state a welcoming place that is going to be able to utilize um, uh, the workers that are going to be coming in and looking for a place in our community. Right? So we have to allow um, for placemaking and acceptance and um, room for them to grow, right? as we would for, for any, any of our neighbors. Right? Um, Minnesota is becoming a much more diverse state. I mean, that is just plainly evident in the data. And it's also pretty evident when we go out into our communities and see um, how much more rich they are becoming in terms of the, the diversity that we're seeing. Um, the state and the nation's population is aging, and it's going to continue to age probably into the um, next decade at least. Uh, and that's probably where we're going to see at least a period where we're going to have more deaths than births. And so obviously we're going to be more dependent upon that international migration. You know, and, and what does the state and, and, and counties and local areas have to do in order to make sure that they're maintaining um, or taking full advantage of the population shifts and the new dynamics that we're seeing? So again, items to, to recognize and, and think about when we're talking about our labor force shortages, our labor force challenges are who do we want um, to, to encourage to, to come here? How do we make sure um, that the incentives for, for uh, picking Minnesota are still strong? And how do we make sure that we are able to attract them to where the jobs need to be filled? You know, those are some things that we have to really consider when we are planning for um, the future of, of the labor force, uh, the future of um, any sector, the agricultural sector, or, or any other um, in terms of knowing who your workers are and how to make a place for them in your community. And that's what I got. So I got plenty of time for questions. I neglected to mention that I love to take questions while I'm presenting, but I didn't mention that, so you were all very courteous, and I appreciate that. But you can hit me with what you've got now. Just not very hard, not in the face. So what else could be done uh, to combat this or to uh, deal with this uh, forthcoming labor shortage? Um, are there other things that can be done uh, to, to that? Um, other things other than being um, welcoming, encouraging, and uh, of international migration. Um, so, if we think, so one of the things that people often leave these or, or you know pull me aside after a talk, and, and it's like, well, you know, how do we increase that fertility rate? It's like, well, you don't. Um, that is a, a long-term trend, and it is part of our. Um, is influenced by, by social aspects that have put a um, higher inf interest on um, economic independence, which uh, going to uh, result in smaller families, right? Uh, we have seen over the past several decades, perhaps half century, um, you know, more and more um, uh, two uh, dual income families, um, which leaves, um, makes it more difficult to have larger families, and that's you know, part of the reason that we're, we're looking at um, uh, smaller families. Part of the reason that, that our uh, age at first marriage and our age, our onset of first child, is, is the ages are getting higher is because we're partaking in more post-secondary education um, or internships or, or some sort of training that is um, delaying those aspects. Those things are not bad, right? So if we talk about our, our population becoming more um, you know, economically independent, our population becoming more educated, um, those are, are not um, bad situations. Um, some things that can be done are maybe alleviating some of the burdens on some of our younger families. When we think about things like poverty, they do tend to um, concentrate in um, younger persons and persons uh, with children. Um, so making... Um, having children more economically viable is a good thing. You know, if we think about back to the, you know, the early part of the last century and in the century before that, when we had much higher fertility rates, children were an asset to the family, right? Children provided um, free labor, uh, right, on the farm. They were, they were actually useful in, in our lives, right? I mean, oh, wait a minute. Um, it, but no, seriously, they, they actually, they were, they were a net economic positive to, to families. As we have moved and become more urban, um, in, in, you know, taken, you know, and, and those those um, 
activists in the, in the first part of the last century wouldn't let us use child labor anymore. Um, you know, the kids that we have have become a net negative economically. Of course, they're always a positive to us emotionally and, and with all that connection kind of stuff, but um, economically, they um, have become a bit of a drain. So alleviating some of that drain, turning them into um, something more positive. I'm not trying to say we need to pay people to have children because we have seen um, in the world that that doesn't really work either because these social constraints are, are, are often much stronger than the um, pecuniary incentives that we can we can offer. Right. Um, so having um, supporting of, of families uh, and their needs is something that, that can be done um, that might stem the, the declining fertility rates to some degree. Um, you know, and just, you know, we really have to remember that in order to continue to grow the population, uh, we are going to have to be uh, bringing in people from, from outside and being warm and welcoming to them is going to be the way that we allow them to find a place in our community to put down roots and to continue um, to grow the state overall. Does that answer? Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's uh, a long term, or I think this has been happening for years. And I do believe it's an education thing. Um, so at some point in time, children, change from a blessing to a burden. Right. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Um, I, there was five of us kids when I was growing up, and I'm doing my part. <laughs> you had more than two, so you're contributing to population growth. Good job. It, it, is, a, it is a, and we're single income family, um, and I would agree with you, uh, with two incomes, it's just not going to happen as much. It just doesn't. Right. Um, and I, I think it's an education thing. I, I think we've got to, as you stated, I, I think we do need to uh, welcome uh, the diverse uh, labor people to increase our labor force and everything. But I think it actually can start with organic growth, what we have here, too. And that's kind of something. I, I didn't hear you say, you know, that's fine, it's your, your talk and everything. Yeah. I think we've got to We've got to work on our own organic growth too. So I think that what you're, when you say organic growth, I think you're, what you're talking about is ultimately gets down to fertility, right? You're talking about growing um, the base to have more children in the state. And you know, that is a way that populations can grow, but even if fertility started today, we would not have workers that are ready to enter the workforce for around 20 years, right? So that's not going to, Right, it's not going to alleviate our 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 our, our, our short-term population or short-term um, labor force issues, and what you're also thinking about is is counteracting decades of, of social change, right? Um, and that's going to be particularly hard to do without some sort of draconian measures that would would be, I think, most people would consider to be anti-American. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, the the, the types of policies that would need to be um, enacted to have a significant impact on fertility. I mean, think about types of policies around the world that have had an impact on fertility. Um, of course, it's going in the, in the opposite direction, but you know, China's one child policy, um, their fertility has crashed to the point of around one, you know, so even lower than ours. You know, and what they were trying to combat um, politically was a exploding population that they were worried about was going to um, you know, impoverish the nation for, for the foreseeable future. So they instituted policy, and it had drastic consequences that, that they were not necessarily intending. So if we were trying to establish policies that would have a significant impact on fertility, we really have to be careful and understand what exactly we're doing and how that fits into the American individual identity model of, of um, encouragement and, and, and I don't want to take everybody's time but as this thing progresses yeah. uh, and, and we see the you know the scale you know we have some of these graphs that look like hourglasses or whatever yeah, yeah. you know and things like that you know and as the young people have less and less children and even the other um, the other 
races, if you will, if they have less than, I, I know they're not right now. But, but they will, yeah. It, it's just going to get worse. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the future, so we, what we expect to see is a, um, a period that might either see flat or perhaps negative population growth um, as the baby boom population begins to feel the expected mortality. After that slump, that decline is over, we expect the population to recover a bit and beginning, begin to increase in, in size again. Um, part of the reason we're going to see declines is because there is just such a large generation that is moving um, out of the workforce and into the, the retirement years. And as we, they move forward and begin to leave the population, that's going to decrease our total population. Our working age population, um, you know, one thing to notice from that graph is the sides are relatively consistent. Um, so at least for the foreseeable future, we don't see necessarily drastic declines in the um, working age population. Actually, as we see the Generation X, which is a narrow generation, move into the retirement age, we actually might see proportionally more persons available in those prime working year ages. Um, but as we move forward, um, sans sort of some sort of really drastic policy measures that I don't think most people would agree with, um, we're going to have to grow the population through migration. Um, now, whether we can do that domestically or internationally, um, that really has to be something that we need to sit down and think about. Um, but migration is going to be vital to us in any sense. Yes, ma'am? Um, the fertility rate that you mentioned, 2.3 down to the is that a national number, or is that in Minnesota? And if so, how does that compare fertility rate compared to states around us? Compared to states, what? Compared to states around us. Oh, um, overall, uh, fertility rates have been declining um, similarly. So the state and the national uh, fertility rates are are, are um, fairly comparable between that 1.6 and 1.7 ish. Um, the, the 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 rates that I was quoting, um, I just off the top of my head, I, I, I believe that the state rate was like 1.72 and the national rate was like 1.68, so relatively close um, to one another. Um, and as I mentioned, those have been declining um, since about the 1970s. Um, and I forgot the second part of your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> what was the? Uh, Okay, great. Uh, yes, ma'am? Are the state and national trends um, very similar to what you presented today, or is there differences, regional differences? There are some regional differences, um, especially if we think about um, the fertility rates. Um, you know, different groups have, have different fertility rates. Um, although groups that have been in the United States for multiple generations tend to, tend to have convergent, meaning they're coming together, um, um, fertility rates. So, for example, the the long the, the um, white and the African American fertility rates are fairly close, maybe off by a tenth of a point or something like that. But they're they're fairly close. Um, similar with um, our Asian populations that have been here for some time. Um, Native American populations tend to have a slightly higher fertility rate um, on average. Um, our multiple race uh, fertility rates tend to be slightly higher also. They're all b below two um, for domestic populations or domestically born populations. Um, but, but there are some uh, variations. Uh, and there are also some national variations too. So for example, Utah has the highest fertility rate uh, in the nation. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but uh, it's fairly high. Uh, and they're also um, one of the fastest growing states as well in terms of, uh, of proportion. So there are some regional differences. There tend to be also some higher fertility rates um, down south. Uh, and there's also differences in those uh, statistics for um, age at first marriage and onset of first child, things like that as well. So there, there are some national and regional differences, but um, overall they are fairly similar and trend in similar directions. Yes, sir. If, if immigration is going to be our solution, mm -hmm. how do we make it easier for that to happen? That is a good question. Um, and I would suggest calling your representatives to talk to them about how we can make those sorts of changes easier. Um, I'm, just, I'm just telling you what we can see and, and what's going to happen in the future. Making the change is up to you. <laughs> yes, sir. 
looking at the uh, the population structure mm -hmm. diagram you had. Yep. That was for statewide. How different would that be looking at a specific Jackson County or a Faribault County? Would it mirror that hourglass shape? Um, I'd have to actually go and make the graphics to, to see precisely what they're, but they, they're going to be likely similar. What you're probably going to see, <clears throat> if I were to make those graphics, is a bit of, I, my advisor always used to call it wasp wasted, um, when they sort of go in like, like that, like the Generation X did. You're probably going to see some contractions around the uh, 18 to 25 year old groups because a lot of folks leave um, more sparsely populated counties for post-secondary education. Um, you know, so th there's generally some contractions in our more sparsely populated areas in those age groups. They tend to begin to widen out again in the late 30s, 40s kind of age group. Um, so that, that are some, some differences, but broadly speaking, you know, in terms of a um, larger top, from the, the millennial generation, excuse me, from the baby boom generation, that's going to be fairly universal. Um, another thing we're gonna see in some of our rural communities is sort of a, a general contraction in all of the age groups um, under um, the baby boom generation, generally depending upon the area. So those are kind of some of the variations. So in more populated areas, you might just see the de de decrease in the college age populations and sort of a recovery. And in some of our very small population counties, you might just see a large top and then a very narrow base on those graphs. Would you see a gender difference? More males leaving, more females? Sometimes, like um, not so much as we used to see, like in the mining areas, those tended to be more heavy on the male side. Um, you do see some differences. You know, you can often tell, um, for example, where prisons are by looking at population structures because you see um, strong. Um, uh, male sides from 18 to 65 usually. Um, you can also find, you can obviously find college counties with significant, you know, if you look at the population structures, they have much more persons from 18 to 25 than, than, than would be expected in a normal population. Um, so there, there is significant variation dependent upon the um, size and composition and dominant industries in, in particular areas as well. Yes, sir. Well, I think Canada is working on policy for a while. I'm not even really that sure. How far can I learn from them? Is there anything from Canada? Well, uh, you know. I'm not an expert in, 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 in Canadian migration. I, I, I have uh, colleagues that, 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 that talk about it, but um, you know, Canada's immigration system is very um, different um, than ours. Um, you know, their population is probably a tenth of what uh, the U.S.'s population is, and a, and a lot of it lives right along the, the border. You know, so their immigration policies uh, may be more aimed at uh, overall growth than um, US, U.S. international uh, migration policies are. You know, we tend to have um, a more of a capped model for our migration. Um, but, you know, to be, I'm just going to be real honest. I can't, I can't necessarily speak directly to the uh, components that are, that are uh, present in, in the Canadian migration. Um, but, you know, being under, they recognize that their population is going to be dependent upon international migration, and there is less of a stigma and demonization of, of those migrants um, in a general sort of national sense. There obviously are regional differences and things like that, but um, more generally. Does that make sense? Okay. Sure. Yes. So on one of your graphs, you showed uh, post pandemic the unemployment rate has really recovered, mm -hmm. um, but the workforce has not. Um, right. So the, there was a decline in the available workforce uh, that was probably beyond what would be expected from just uh, people hitting retirement age. So. Do you have uh, some explanations for? You know, I did some, um, I actually have a look at this question uh, a bit. And my initial hypothesis was that um, if we looked at persons um, that are beyond or approaching retirement age, that perhaps a lot of those persons didn't necessarily need to work um, or could retire and just didn't re-enter the labor force. So I took a look at the, the data, and I found that that wasn't really the case. Um, what we were actually seeing 
uh, as a lot of um, younger folks delaying entry into the labor force, and we were seeing that a lot more persons were participating in post-secondary education. Um, you know, and if we think about what was happening during the pandemic, um, if you can't work, you know, this is the same thing that we see when we see high levels of unemployment. We tend to, to see college enrollment being counter-secular to the uh, employment rates. As employment rate goes up, typically the college enrollment also goes up. And so those play tandem. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw significant spikes in unemployment. Um, we didn't see the same spikes in post-secondary education, but we did see increases. So, um, you know, my initial hypothesis was wrong. It wasn't necessarily older folks. It was younger folks um, not entering the labor force. So we may see some recovery on that, especially with how strong the labor market, how strong the jobs market is uh, in the state. We may see um, folks that might come out of post-secondary education, or we might see um, a period where uh, we have a lot of graduates that are entering the labor force um, after some time in, in post-secondary education. So that's what I would expect. Was there also um, an increase in those who, uh, you know, sort of self-employed um, during that time period? There was an article so, in the Star and Tribune, and I think about a number of people, um, you know, sort of uh, getting out of the labor force and starting to do hobby farming, if you will. Okay. Um, you know, I can't necessarily speak to the hobby farming aspect of it, but you know, I you know, I, so to be a farm, I think the USDA just requires a thousand dollars annual sales. I, I believe is what the <clears throat> marker is. So, um, but if we think about what we're taught, <clears throat> gosh darn it, if we think about what we're talking about with the uh, labor force participation rate, those hobby, hobby farmers would still be included in that, right? Because they are um, actively engaged in gainful employment uh, at that point. So it wouldn't necessarily be. Uh, anybody who's self-employed would still be counted as participating in the labor force, uh, and they would have a job. You know, and this is also a distinction that, that it confuses people as well. I was at a previous presentation talking to folks about labor force participation, and one of the questions was, well, there, uh, he, this person was at a recent uh, presentation from the folks at the uh, Department of Education, um, employment and labor or economic development and they said something to the effect of there was like 90,000 um, Minnesotans on unemployment and I had to remind that person that definitionally people who are on unemployment are in the labor force because they're actively seeking employment you know, so when we talk about the labor force it's anybody who's employed or actively seeking employment um, so that that often uh, often confuses folks what we're talking about <clears throat> people leaving the labor force are not in the labor force, the top reasons that we're seeing are, of course, retirement, um, taking care of family members, taking care of, uh, which include taking care of children, um, you know, injury, disability, those sorts of things. Um, so, and, and, and of course, um, participation in post-secondary education. So those are really the top sorts of reasons that we see for people not being in the labor force. And we would expect to see continuing declines in the labor force participation rate as we have more and more people pushing past that 65 year mark. So the decline in the overall trend and decline in um, labor force participation is expected. Uh, it was just a little jarring to see it over such a short period. And that's you know, likely due to the economic impacts of, uh, of the COVID pandemic. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think you said that the net people leaving the state was higher than people coming into the state, is that right? Domestically, domestically. so domestically. domestically, right. Is there any demographics of people leaving, more people leaving the state? Like, what are the characteristics of those people? I mean, there are we can, there are ways to, to investigate that topic. There, um, it's not something that I've done for a little bit uh, in, in terms of looking at the, that particular question. Um, you know, I, I tend to I, I make all the population estimates for the for the area outside of the Twin Cities, and so that's what I um, spend a lot of my research time doing. But there are those data that we can make some statements about those persons. It's a it's a little hard just because, as I mentioned. You know, we don't keep registry records of, of people's movements. Um, and so what we generally are able to glean come from uh, sample surveys. Um, there, there, there are issues with those, but we do, we do have the ability to get some information uh, about migrants, uh, where they're going and, wh and what their characteristics are. I was just kind of curious if it 
older demographics moving into warmer places, or perhaps um, have also heard the kind of um, people not liking the tax rates here as well. So I didn't know if there was any sort of ability for those. Yeah, um, th th there is some, right? So we do see, uh, you know, the areas in the nation that see the highest growth right now are in those that Sun Belt region, you know, and we do see um, retirees. We also see a lot of folks that um, maintain dual residency, so our snowbirds, um, things like that. Um, so yeah, that is definitely um, something that, that that does have an effect. Um, we see that the um, <clears throat> weather in terms of our retiring population tends to have a much stronger effect than do um, the tax considerations. I don't want to say that it has no effect because obviously it does. We know it does. Um, but um, you know, what I what I have seen from opinion surveys is that uh, a lot of folks uh, in Minnesota recognize that we have significant taxes, but they also recognize that we have significant benefits for those taxes as well. So it's a kind of a, a trade-off. Um, I just haven't seen, when I've looked at those surveys, that, that the tax is being the top reason for people leaving. The weather typically, you know, we have to get rid of the riffraff somehow, you know. <laughs> yes, sir. Coming out of the COVID situation, uh, would you say there was a move to single income uh, families versus dual income families? Is that part of where the labor shrunk? Some of it is that, you know, because, you know, as I mentioned, one of the top categories for, um, People not being in the labor force is taking care of a uh, family and family members, and so, you know, there there are um, health reasons that are that are, that are you know both keeping both both taking care of family members and uh, individual illness and injury um, are, are some of the top reasons, and those would encompass people that are uh, either feeling the effects of or are you know have family members that are feeling the effects of, of COVID long term. We also, you know, had, I mean, we, we can't um, ignore that we had um, not an insignificant number of people die um, as a result of COVID. You know, we have excess deaths that would not have been um, occurring since the pandemic.